everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be continuing with my new series where I take a look at how I made my older pre-YouTube costumes. And I've decided that today would be a fun time to tell you all about the most complicated and one of the most time-consuming projects I have ever made, my Victorian Child Ensemble. I made this outfit back in 2016, and it's actually a copy of an extant dress that's in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. I fell in love with this dress as soon as I saw it, and when a few friends and I decided that we wanted to be Victorian children at Costume College, it seemed like the perfect match. The entire ensemble consists of pantalettes, a hoop skirt, a ruffled petticoat, a skirt with an attached overskirt, bodice, boots, and a reticule. <laughs> I started the project by making the pantalettes in May of 2016, and they're made of white quilting cotton from Joann's. I used a standard costume bloomer pattern as my base, though I narrowed the legs a little and I added extra length to allow for tucks at the bottom. I prefer my pantalettes and bloomers to have elastic waistbands, as that makes them easier to take off and put on when using the restroom in costume. The legs have four rows of tucks around the bottom instead of the elastic that the pattern calls for, and they're trimmed with ruffled eyelet lace from Joann's. The petticoat is made of muslin and has angled side gores, a straight gathered panel in the back, and a slightly gored panel in the front. It's pleated around the sides and gathered in the back into the waistband. There are two ruffles on the base of the skirt, a 12 inch deep ruffle on top and then a more heavily gathered 17 inch deep ruffle around the bottom. This is actually the same petticoat that I later added a third ruffle to around the bottom of the skirt to make it a full length ruffled petticoat for my 1830s through 50s costumes. So A, I don't actually have it on the dress form under this right now, and B, if I ever do go to wear this costume again, I'll either have to rip off the bottom ruffle of that petticoat, or I'll have to make an all new petticoat. To make the dress, I used ivory silk taffeta purchased from the fabric district, as well as five yards of pink silk, which to be honest, I forget where I purchased it from. I also can't remember how many yards of the ivory silk that I purchased, but I used every last bit for this project. The pink that I purchased actually wound up being the totally wrong color, so this has actually been dyed with tangerine writ dye. Now it did wind up getting just a touch crinkly and it lost some of that nice smoothness that taffeta has in its texture, but the color improvement was 100% worth it. The pleats that are around the bottom of the skirt are eight and a half inches wide and they're made of seven panels of the pink silk taffeta backed with nine panels of silk organza. The taffeta panels are all treated with spray starch to add stiffness back into the dyed silk before being backed with that silk organza like you can see right here. Now by backing the panels with the organza, I A, didn't have to worry about hemming all of the pleats, and B, they actually gave the pleats a lot more body. The skirt itself is made out of eight panels of the ivory silk, and most of that width is pleated into the waistband with large knife pleats, and then the back of the skirt is tightly gathered into the waistband. The overskirt is made out of six tab-like panels of ivory silk. Each one is backed with the same ivory silk. By backing the silk on the skirt, overskirt, and even the bertha, it meant that I didn't have to worry about hemming or finishing all these zigzag hems of the skirt. By sewing them right sides together, clipping all the corners and seam allowances, and then turning them right sides out, it made finishing this bottom edge much, much easier and cleaner. By the way, while making the dress, I did actually find out that the original ensemble only has five panels to the overskirt, but since I was making this for me, a plus size adult, and not a slim preteen girl, I think it made a lot of sense to add that extra panel. I also didn't know the exact amount of panels until I was nearly a month and a half into this project. In late June of 2016, I wrote to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston to see if they would be able to send me any additional pictures since the only picture online was of the front 
and they were actually kind enough to quite quickly send me additional pictures. Ones that showed both the front and the back laid out on a table, as well as the overskirt panels laid out flat. And it turns out there was actually even a pink belt with a bow attached, which was not displayed on the dress when it was photographed for their collection on their website. Of course, by the time I wrote them for the picture, a lot of my dress was completed already. So I really couldn't have changed from six to five overskirt panels, even if I had wanted to. The other thing that I found out from these photos is that the bodice and skirt on the original were actually connected all in one. So in other words, they were a dress. As I had already made mine separately at that point, I kept mine as separate pieces. What I did instead, which also differed from the original, was that I combined both the underskirt and the overskirt into one waistband so that it would save on bulk on the waist. And since the original dress was photographed without its belt, and also only photographed from the front, I omitted both the pink belt altogether, as well as a pink bow that was supposed to be on the back of the Bertha. I also added short puffed sleeves to mine, whose cuffs are trimmed with a small pink bow, as well as two rows of the same pink bias tape trim that makes up all of the chevrons everywhere else on the outfit. I don't like wearing sleeveless things, so this was an addition that would make the dress way more comfortable for me to wear. Those are really the only changes that I made between the original and mine, though. So let's get back onto the skirt construction. The pleats around the bottom of the underskirt are pleated up into two inch wide box pleats, whereas the overskirt and the Bertha pleats are one inch wide box pleats. The pleats are laid out underneath the zigzag hem and the two are stitched together using machine top stitching three eighths of an inch from the edge of that hem so that the machine stitching will then be covered up by one of the rows of the pink chevrons. The chevrons are made out of strips of the pink silk, which were folded using a bias tape maker, and there's about 24 strips running the bias width of the fabric just on the underskirt alone. These are sewn end to end before being fed through the bias tape maker and pressed with an iron. For some reason, I stupidly did the bottom edge of the points as actual binding. So in other words, actually wrapping around the edge of the points even though the edges were already finished. The top side of this bias strip, as well as all of the other bias strips, are all hand sewn on with tiny whip stitches. In the underskirt alone, just sewing on all of the binding, it was about 72.77 yards of hand sewing, since each row had to be sewn down by hand on both sides of each strip. I started all of this hand sewing on May 27th and basically forced myself to do a little bit of the hand sewing every single day. For example, like sewing a quarter of a row of the underskirt or an entire overskirt panel so that I would finish in time for costume college. Luckily, I made this while I was unemployed, so while I did have some commission work and some other sewing taking up some of my time, I was also able to devote a fair amount of time to all of this hand sewing. In fact, I even brought my project with me both on a trip home to California in June, as well as a week-long trip to Lake Tahoe in early July. In all, there are five rows of chevron trim on the underskirt and two rows on the overskirt, though so these two rows do go all the way around each of the tabs, including up the sides. The tabs are joined together not only at the waistband, but also by two bows in between each tab, a smaller one on the top and a larger one just above where the chevrons are, so 12 bows in total on the overskirt. The top bow where the skirt opening is, is actually only sewn onto one of the tabs it's next to, and then it closes to the other tab with a small snap. The original overskirt, since it was a separate piece from the underskirt, actually did not have bows where the opening was at all, since this is where that large bow on the belt would have hung down. I used up almost every last scrap of my ivory silk in making my bodice. I used a bodice pattern that I had used earlier that year when making my black silk bustle ball gown bodice, though I changed the neckline pretty significantly, and I switched it from a front closure to a back closure. The bodice is lined with cotton twill, and it has a large, almost boat-like neckline. It closes up the back with ivory silk fabric-covered buttons, and the Bertha is patterned based on the bodice neckline, and is lined with a darker cream silk shantung that I had in my stash, 
since I was out of the ivory silk taffeta, which again allowed me to turn all of the points all along the edges. A shorter row of the pink pleats made in the same method as the skirts are attached to the Bertha base and it's trimmed with two rows of the pink bias strips. The sleeves are based off of some random Truly Victorian puff sleeve pattern and are lined with muslin. For my shoes, I ordered the Sarah Cream and Oxblood Victoria boots from Fugui, which are pull-on ankle boots with decorative buttons and elastic gussets. I prepped them with acetone and then I painted everywhere that was previously oxblood color with a salmon pink color made from various tones of Angela's leather paint in order to match my dress. To be perfectly honest, because of the extremely flat insole of these boots, they're not the most comfortable boots on my feet, but they do look super cute and they're actually a pretty reasonable price point. I've linked to the boots down in the description if you're interested. I purchased an inexpensive hoop skirt on eBay so that I could cannibalize the hoop steel from it, and it was originally a full-length hoop skirt made of nylon fabric. So in other words, it was pretty awful and not really what I needed. I was originally just planning on shortening the purchased hoop skirt, but since I wound up with a little extra time before costume college, I decided to completely remake the fabric portion of the hoop skirt. It's made of four gourd sections out of printed calico quilting cotton with channels made out of purchased bias tape for the hoop steels to run through. For my reticule, I found a slightly antique looking teddy bear at Goodwill, and yes, I know that teddy bears weren't really a thing until 40 or so years later, but whatever. I opened the center back of the bear, took the stuffing out of his torso, and made little caps for his arms, legs, and head so that the stuffing wouldn't escape from there into the torso. Then I made a little purse lining out of tan cotton, stitched it into the inside of the torso, and added snap closures to the center back seam. I also made a little bow tie for him and attached a wristlet strap to the back of one ear, both made out of the pink silk so that he would match the dress. He doesn't hold much, but it's about a seven by five inch compartment at its widest point, so he can fit my caseless phone, at least at the time, a hotel key card, a couple of bobby pins, and a credit card, which is all they really needed for costume college. Thankfully, the entire ensemble was finished with a few days to spare, so I actually had a very relaxing last few days before costume college and no panic sewing was necessary. It was incredibly fun to wear with our small group of Victorian children, and that year the Friday Night Social even had lots of little games set up, plus cupcakes to eat, which was all made even more fun when you were dressing and acting like a Victorian child. My only real regret is that I've only worn this outfit the one time. It's rather specific, but I very much would like to wear it again to another event. Although it's not a 100% exact reproduction of the dress at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, I think it's a near perfect representation, at least of the original image on their website, with the addition of the sleeves of course. And as I mentioned before, it remains my most hand sewing intensive project to date. And I believe the second most time consuming project, probably only after 1890s Elsa and its thousands of rhinestones. Though to be honest, it may have even actually taken a little bit longer than Elsa. I really do think that it's one of my proudest sewing achievements to date, especially since I am usually so adverse to hand sewing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into my Victorian child costume from 2016, and hopefully I will find another reason to wear it sometime soon. If you've not yet seen any of my other How I Made videos, you can check out the playlist, which I have linked up here and also down below in the description. And if you liked this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other random costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at LadyRebeccaFashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon, Julie, and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!